Hello everyone, I'm Gemma Buckley, Senior Partnerships Manager at the Independent Cinema Office. You are about to watch a recording of a BFI Film Academy lab session on developing your project and telling your own authentic stories. BFI Film Academy labs are all about helping 16 to 25 year olds break into the screen industries. These monthly practical sessions are led by industry professionals with a focus on explaining the specifics of working in film and television and developing your own skills to become the best screen creative you can be. The labs are programmed across three strands, storytelling, business of film and career ladder. We hope you enjoy today's session. My name is Michaela. I'm a film programmer at the Independent Cinema Office. I'm very delighted to be hosting um, today's BFI Lab about developing your project and telling your own authentic stories. Uh, and it's very exciting to be joined this evening by Miriam Raja. Now, Miriam uh, graduated from the National Film and Television School in 2018 with her graduation short, Azar, um, which was nominated for the BAFTA for Best British Short that year. After graduating from NFTS, uh, Miriam directed an episode of the Netflix show Top Boy after um, being part of the director's mentorship scheme there. Um, and it was such a great success uh, that she's been invited back and is directing four episodes, the first four episodes of the latest season. So do look out for those when they come out later this year. Um, she's currently finishing post-production on Top Boy, uh, whilst also developing her own debut feature film with Film 4 and a second feature project with Witchwood Film and the BBC. Uh, very exciting. Um, so just to give you all kind of a sense of some of Miriam's work, a flavour for her kind of uh, directorial voice, we have a trailer for her graduation short film, Azar. Um, can I welcome in Miriam? Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, thank you so much for joining us today, Miriam. Um, that's quite a bio for someone who graduated like five years ago and two of those years were the pandemic years, which pandemic we don't years, yeah. <laughs> yeah, So it's been like only like a couple of years um, because production was like mostly shut down. So um, super impressive work. Um, let's start kind of at the beginning. Um, have you always loved film? Um, and did you start writing first? What kind of drew you into, into writing in the film? Um, I guess, so, uh, so yeah, I, I guess kind of going all the way back to the beginning, mm -hmm. I moved to the UK when I was 11 and I, English wasn't my first language. Um, but there was a year where we, lived above a video store in Bradford and I remember my brother and I would rent out quite a few films almost daily and just watch them um and I grew up watching a lot of Bollywood film which is what my mum was super into um and spoke Urdu fluently um but yeah so we we grew up watching lots of films and I remember being able to enjoy the films in English even if I didn't quite understand them like I didn't understand the language but I was still able to really enjoy it and like feel all the emotions that I was supposed to feel, enjoy the scenes as they were being played out. Um, but it it definitely wasn't like a conscious idea that I wanted to do this or go into film. I guess you could say I was definitely like into storytelling in some form. Like I remember I, I kept thinking I would become an author, even though I couldn't finish anything I'd start writing. <laughs> um, and then I moved to Slough when I was, yeah, I think a couple of years later, we moved to Slough and 
for anyone who knows Slough, um, there's not that much to do in Slough. And then I remember one summer I did Google, you know, things to do over the summer holidays. And <laughs> an idea that came up was make films with your friends. Um, so I found out there was actually a production company in Slough called Resource Productions. Um, they run some of the BFI film labs, actually, the Academy, BFI Film Academy labs. Um, and they, at the time, they would do lots of workshops for young people. So I called them up and um, they invited me along to one of their after school workshops and they gave me a bit of money and I went and made a horror film uh, with my friends and uh, really enjoyed it. So that's kind of, but even then I still didn't think it was going to be a career path. Like I didn't think it was a viable career. I was kind of just continuing with my mum's dream of becoming a lawyer. Um, <laughs> but eventually, I think as I kept doing it, I thought, oh, okay, this is what I want to keep doing forever. Um, yeah. So when did you start thinking that, um, you know, filmmaking might be a career um, that was something that you that you could see in your own future? I think maybe it was around... Uh, there's that weird thing that happens around A-level times when your teachers start sort of saying that the A-levels you're going to pick are going to define the career you're going to go on to have and the uni you have to go to. So I think it was maybe around then when I was thinking, oh, should I pick media studies and what's the route I can go down? Um, but I didn't. Yeah. And I think as I was researching and getting more and more into film, I learned, OK, director, author, OK, writer, director. That's what I want to do. Um but of course, I didn't grow up with examples of people like me as directors. And you just kind of thought, um, like, I don't know, I looked up to maybe like a weird mix of directors. So it was like Jean-Luc Godard in French New Wave or Tim Burton, both of them I was very <laughs> into when I was a teenager. Um, but yeah, I think it was probably when I decided to go for my A-levels and then uh, decided I would go do film production at uni. Maybe it was around then. I, I still had no clue how I was going to do it, um, like what the actual path is. And I just thought maybe if I'd study it and keep studying it, it'll buy me time until I figure it out. <laughs> so you can like find a way in yeah. from Slough. <laughs> exactly, yeah. I was like, okay, I need to get out of Slough, go Bournemouth. <laughs> <laughs> so you studied film at, at Bournemouth University? Yeah, so um, there's two unions at Bournemouth. There's the Arts Union. The, the other one but I went to the arts uni yeah um so what was your what was that like for you and what was your path from there um into NFTS yeah so at Bournemouth uh it was a four-year course because they do a year zero which I don't know if they still do um but that one was very it was quite arty farty it was like you know you just did lots of other things but film it felt um but I enjoyed it still and like it's I think in, in the third year of the four years or like in the second year, you start to pick a specialism. Um, so those of us who wanted to be directors, you had to kind of like not compete, but you had to make these little shorts and then get picked. And that's how they make the cohort. Um, so I grew a lot in terms of like finding my voice, I would say, in Bournemouth. That's when I made probably my first short film that I, that was not in English. It was in Urdu language. And it was really small and I got my mum to be in it. Um, and I think that's when I kind of realised the kind of films I was drawn to making. Um, so in terms of that, it was a great sort of playground, four years of just experimenting and honing it, uh, honing it in, in terms of my skills. Um, but I also remember in the first year, I experimented with documentary a bit. And I'd say that taught me a lot about um maybe I guess the way I communicate with actors um people uh, I also learned I did not want to be doing documentary I I found the uncertainty of where it was going to be too um yeah it didn't suit me I'd say um but I learned a lot and I thought it was very useful to do um then after Bournemouth there was definitely that weird period you have where you kind of think, okay, what next? Um, I moved back to Slough and um, 
I, at the time, there was a thing called Random Acts, which I think is still running. So that's the Channel 4 scheme. And I applied to that with Resource Productions and made a short film. And then there was also um, iShorts, which is like iFeatures and iShorts, which I don't know if it's still around, but I also applied for iShorts. Um, but that took a year. And I think that's when I really realized how long like how hard it is to try and make a film outside of a system like Bournemouth, where they kind of give you the money, they give you the crew, they give you the camera. So that was quite hard. Um, but I did make a, I was short and I made a random axe. And then I uh, <laughs> I realized I needed to do something else. So I started working. I worked at London Short Film Festival. Uh, so I started working in the festival circuit, but like not as a programmer, I just sort of did... Um, I think they were doing like a like a sort of placement, work placement thing. And then I helped with print transport. So it wasn't really work that was necessarily creative, but I still got to be on the other side. And as a short filmmaker, you spend a lot of time at festivals, but obviously like submitting to it. And this time I got to be on the other side, seeing how it actually works, how do films get picked? And I think that taught me a lot. Um, and then I was also teaching filmmaking to kids and stuff <laughs> but then eventually yeah uh, nfts happened after um uh yeah after I, I think within a year then i went to the nfts um which was really good yeah it's really interesting what you said about um like trying out documentary thinking that uh, might be something you're interested in and then being like no <laughs> definitely yeah. not um how much trial and error has there been up to now in you kind of finding your directorial voice, finding out what your vision is? Um, and do you feel like you've you've found it or is it still like everything is a test, everything is a trial? Uh, I think it's an interesting one. I think well, obviously, so like right at the beginning when I started making short films and I'll, I'll count those years, the very young years of like, you know, being 14, 15, I was very, I was making horror films and then I was making, I made like one little like black and white film noir and like <laughs> um, I tried to make this thriller, but I realized I was emulating um, these genre techniques, which I thought were quite easy to understand at that age. They were quite easy to try and replicate and you learned from it. And I think it took pressure away from like, who am I? I was just learning how to frame. I was learning how to direct my friends. Um, and I think that's the craft part of being a director. And once you kind of hone that and once you've got that under your belt, you can then, I think your craft, it's great to have that and it's great to know how to frame stuff. But like you, I'm a big believer in having voice and not just visually. I just mean like, who are you and what do you politically stand for? And what do you, how do you see the world and how do you want to tell other people about that world? Um, and that I think just stems from like your interests and stuff. Um, for me, it's very much been focused on like my mum and I, like I'm super into the mother daughter relationships and dynamics, um, and things within my culture. So I think it's been definitely a focus on that the last 10 years, I'd say at least. Um, and then I think interestingly, I feel like my voice changes as I grow. And as I change, so I'd be um, interested to see where that sort of takes me in the next few years. I mean, that's interesting. Like, how do you um, like how do you view your own early films now? Like, when you look back at Azar, how do you feel about it? Are you like, oh, there's things I would do differently, or you were like, no, that represents exactly who I was at that time, and so it's like a perfect capsule. Yeah, I think um, I think so. I if I watch back. Uh, like say if I watch back my short film that I made at uni my grad film then it was called Tazib and it was uh, it's about this woman who marries she's a Pakistani woman marries a Pakistani man but he lives in the UK so he's a bit more westernized and it's about their marriage which is um, you know he's not he's not mean he's not abusive but the marriage just doesn't fit it's just there's no love between them um, and I did watch it back recently actually at, at a screening and I was um, struck by how many things I still feel would be the decisions I would make now. But then also there's other things where I was like definitely cringing and thinking, ah, oh, I held on that for too long or maybe I would have done that differently. I feel like I, 
what I noticed was maybe there were certain decisions I didn't do. Maybe I wonder if I had a lack of confidence, like I was afraid the audience wouldn't get something. And maybe now I feel, oh, you know what? I would just cut here or there. Like I, um, I don't want to push that. And so I don't feel I've, uh, I can see the evolution, but I can also see how it's been consistent. Um, and I don't feel stale yet. It's, I think that's what's important. I think there can definitely be a point when you start to think, am I repeating myself? Am I becoming stale? Am I being predictable? Is it not challenging me anymore? Like, is it, do I step on set? And it feels like a piece of cake. It shouldn't. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think that's what I try and keep in check, basically um yeah I hope that answers that question I'm not sure but yeah no, it does it does um uh that that's really interesting um I keep saying that that's really interesting but you're saying many interesting things <laughs> um how do you kind of go about um the writing process like do, are you kind of full of ideas all the time um like where do you find your inspirations from um I think definitely visually. Um, so certain shorts, I've just had a very clear image. Maybe I came across an image and then that stays in my head. Um, I also very much, I think sometimes it can come from like conversations I've had with my mom and then it sticks or like you hear about someone's story from some other time and that sticks in your mind. Um, for example, with Azar, that's very much, that came from basically, I came across these images of um, these black and white images of these Algerian women. And they were like portraits of them. Um, and uh, I found out that the photographer, Marc Garanger, he was a French photographer sent to the village. And his job was to get like their photos taken for their ID um, during the French occupation. And so he had to get the women to unveil and take their photo and obviously, you kind of when you understand the context of that it feels really powerful but what I was really struck by was how they're in such a vulnerable position where this white man has come and told them to unveil but then they were staring at the camera with such defiance and I was really taken with that um so that image and sort of the story behind the photograph stayed with me and then I thought of this idea of this tribe of women and the, Maybe there's a war that's been going on. And then what happens when they come across like one white man on a horse who comes to the village? Um, so that went through a few like shifts and changes, but that definitely, I can say, I can pinpoint the idea of this film back to that as being the kernel where it started from. Um, yeah. Uh, I really love that. Do you find that um, you are really influenced by your life here? Do you prefer to um, write films in Urdu language? Uh, yeah, interesting. I think, um, I wonder if it's like a byproduct of having been brought up on Bollywood. I think it's also a byproduct of like having this, like almost being allergic to seeing TV series with South Asian characters that look like my mom, but then they speak with this really accented English. <laughs> and I'm just like, my mom would not like talk to me like that at home. Like why can't characters just speak in Urdu and it'd be fine. Um, but I think a lot of the stories are definitely set in domestic settings. Like that's most of the short films I've been making. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure. I think it's just, I feel like if that's what the character needs then that's what it should be but I did I did also make a short film at the NFTS which is all in Yoruba and that was translated with the actors so I wrote the script in English and then the actors helped me translate it and I hope they say the right thing but like I don't know <laughs> they're not just <laughs> tricking you they're not yeah. just like ha, ha, ha. <laughs> exactly <laughs> but it just felt true um to the story and to who they would be so I wanted it like I don't want to shy away from it feeling foreign language or subtitled yeah. do you know what I mean that's amazing. I mean, what was that process like working with those actors? Did you, were you worried that things were going to get lost in translation or was it kind of bringing out a sort of cultural witness, richness when you added in layers of, of kind of new language? It was really interesting directing in a language I didn't speak or understand, but I think as a, as a director, what, what, it was quite a nice challenge in the sense that if, um, 
if an actor said the line and I knew something about the line wasn't feeling right, like say she was, she said the line as it's written and as it's meant to be, but it just wasn't sitting right. Um, I couldn't hide behind a word. Like, you know, sometimes you just say, oh, maybe that word isn't right. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe let's change the word. So you try and change the line itself. And this time I couldn't do that because I couldn't pick out which word it was. Yeah. So I just had to kind of really get to the root of the feeling behind the line rather than hide behind but hide behind the line do you know what I mean um so in that sense it was quite interesting but I also found kind of going back to the first story I told of watching films while not understanding the language I was able to still be moved by their performances even if I felt like I could I felt like I was understanding everything that was being said despite the subtitles not being in front of me and I think that's um it hones you into focusing on the emotions so I thought that was quite good. That's really, it's a, it's, um, I've never heard anyone kind of, kind of um, make that point before, but I suppose like, obviously writing is very important. Your script is very important, but being able to be moved by the actor's performance is what kind of lifts out a film. There's a lot that can be forgiven if like, yeah. it's just a really strong performance. Um mm -hmm. How do you kind of how do you how do you as a director kind of bring that out um, of different actors? Do you find that you have to use different techniques um, with different people and kind of speak to their own acting styles? Yeah, I mean, I think yes, definitely. Um, different actors, I think, need and like different ways of being directed, and. Um, uh, it's also quite common to have like three different actors who all three want different ways of being directed and you'll have them in the same scene and you do kind of just have to manage that and it's very much just about managing people communicating taking the time I think some actors um, and I learned that a lot especially on Top Boy which um, a lot of a lot of the cast members on Top Boy for example will be young non-actors um, some of them, it might be their first time being on set and having a camera in front of them. You really have to change your approach for each person um, and yet have like a cohesive sort of level of performance from everyone. Um, but that's your job. So like, for example, with some of the younger actors on Top Boy on the previous season, I realized um, I needed to be very, very clear in what I was asking of them so that they didn't feel like they were getting it wrong or that they had to do it over and over um so I'd sometimes keep the camera rolling and I'd be next to the camera and then I would just tell them okay that was really great let's do that bit again but like just look up when you say that moment and that was very clear and also we didn't have to cut so that we just went all the way back to the beginning like they could stay in the energy and then if I sometimes wanted them to be a bit more riled up I'd just to ask them again and again to say it until I got them to actually <laughs> <laughs> until they were just feeling things <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the other thing that I think a really good technique would be like, for example, um, to keep things fresh, especially when you're doing something over and over and, you know, one of the actors begins to predict what the other one's about to say, I'd sometimes take away one of them and, um, you know, say like, why don't you say this instead? And it's totally, it might be completely bonkers <laughs> and maybe we're not on them and it's not going to be used, but the reaction I get from the other one will be like sheer shock or like anger or you know, they might laugh out loud because it's something they didn't expect. And you get that moment. I think it's fine to use whatever, but you need to have tools and that's what they're called. It's just, you need to have tricks up your sleeve. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm sure everyone here, if you're wanting to be a director, you will have read up several books and stuff, but like, as if, I think is a really good one. Like say, as if you're apologizing. It's as if you're saying, I love you. And usually that works really nicely when they're two opposites. Like if a character's saying, I, I hate you and you say, say as if you're asking for forgiveness, then you might get something really interesting just because it's very conflicting. But some actors don't like that. They don't want that. Others don't want to be told anything. You just have to kind of manage it. The only thing I would say is on set is kind of not the place where I spend a lot of time intellectualizing. Like, I feel like you want to meet up beforehand for a coffee and talk about the history of the character and the meaning of the film, get that all out of the way. But like, because on set, you, re you usually find yourself being quite short for time. Um, so it needs to be something that can be quick and direct and gets a moment out. Um, but yeah, it's all collaboration as well. You can ask your 
assistant director to help you with stuff or your cinematographer to help you. You can ask for an actor to like not be approached by anyone until they have to come on set. So it really is like um, figuring out case by case, basically. Um, so speaking of, of Top Boy, we'll move on to Top Boy. Um, I think we have a trailer um, for the season. Um, oh no, it's actually for, um, I the, think a trailer is for like season one. I'm not sure, one. but it's just, it encapsulates what Top Boy is if anyone here doesn't know what it is. It's a trailer for all of Top Boy. Yes. Um, if they don't know, come on. Get yeah, watching. <laughs> um, so we'll watch the trailer and then I'm going to ask you uh, some questions about Top Boy. Everyone around here thinks they're a big man. They live in this mad world where anyone can get it. The olders are washed. The youngest fear nothing. Am I right in thinking that you started uh, out on Top Boy doing some shadowing as part of their mentoring scheme? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was I was in second year of NFTS, and my agent got in touch and was like, "So I was I was in the edit with Azar. Um, so I'd shot it already, and she said, "Oh, they're reviving Top Boy. Do you remember the show?" And I was like, "Of course I remember from like Channel Four <laughs> days." Um, and they were looking for a mentee. So basically. Um, there were, I think there were four blocks on the first Netflix season. So blocks are like, you divide up the episodes into blocks and each block has its own director, has its own cinematographer. Um, so they were looking for a mentee for the final block, which was being directed by Anil Carrier, who's a great director. Um, so I went and met up and uh, uh, obviously the first question was like, how, you know, how do you see Top Boy fitting into what you do? And it's it's miles apart from the short films I've been making, but um, that's why I thought it would be great to also be part of the challenge to understand how something like this on this sort of scale gets made. Um, so yeah, I got to, as part of the mentee scheme, I got to sort of be on set every day, be in the pre-production and then come into the edit a bit. So watch everything. And um, I started harassing the producers to let me shoot second unit uh and I'm a firm believer in like you don't ask you don't get so I very much was like can I please do some second unit can I please do some second unit um and I was really nervous but they they said yeah so then they let me and I went and shot a few little scenes but I think that gave me heaps of confidence um because it can feel quite daunting like it feels way beyond you and above you and I'd been used to making short films with like fellow students and friends so to be on a set as a director where you don't necessarily know everyone um, and you feel young and inexperienced, that can be quite scary. Um, but uh, that was, yeah, that was a really interesting um, uh, opportunity, basically. Um, what did you learn from your time uh, shadowing Anil? Were there things that you learned that you've kind of brought into your creative practice now? Yes, I. What did I learn? I mean, I I I learned that um, there were the, so there were basically there were 
massive scenes I was reading in the script, like say there was like a huge car chase, like police cars chasing this car and then, or someone being freed from prison and like on, in the back of an ambulance, blah, blah. And I just, as I was reading it, I was like, oh, wow, I'd have no clue how to even begin sort of approaching that logistically. And I, what I saw Neil do was ask a lot of questions and he'd ask the stunt coordinators for their, uh, you know, he would lean on people who knew everything about their department. And that's something I've taken on basically, um, because knowledge is power <laughs> as a director. <laughs> like if I know exactly how that thing is done and how long it takes, I can sort of make better judgments as to do it first up or like after whatever. So I realized like you, you can never look stupid basically you just ask if you don't know you're not meant to know everything anyway like you're you know there's other people there who've been doing who've been heads of their departments for so long like it's their job to know everything about it and um so I think that was a big learning thing because you always feel scared and you think I should know everything but you yeah don't have to yeah I think that's such a big thing uh for everyone is that like curiosity is key and the more you ask the more you know and you don't nobody expects you to know everything like in any scenario it's always better to be kind of inquisitive yes. um about things so um when you come on and direct an episode of like a broader television show an established television show like Top Boy um how much of your own vision and style are you able to bring into the storytelling and what's that process like? I think, um, I think so when you're directing something you've written, you kind of, you know how you're going to shoot it when you're writing it. I feel sometimes like you, you, it's kind of apparent to you how you're going to approach it. Whereas when you're a director who's been brought in, especially in the middle of a season. So I did episode six of the previous season and so that's bang in the middle. Uh, <laughs> you know, other directors have been doing, you know, the previous shows. And the lead director you usually respect that they're going to set up the look or they're going to set up the, you know, they're going to cast most of the actors that you then inherit. You inherit the locations they've chosen. So I think when you're a director who's been hired to come in and direct something in the middle, you very much have to kind of be adaptable. And you also have to respect the material. Um so you might get a script that if I was to shoot Top Boy the way I shoot my short films, I don't think it would work. Um, I really don't think it would work. And I think because it was a show that already had such a such strong visual language from like Jan's first season, the Channel 4 season one, Jan Demange did a great job of setting that up. Um, you want to respect it and you want to sort of do what's right for the material. So with that in mind, I used a lot of handheld. I uh, learned all about all the other ways of shooting sort of this more stylized scenes, I'd say. And I did have sort of like, I guess I had different opinions on certain things and you kind of have to make your judgment and um, not fight your case for you. Yeah, you have to kind of pick your battles, I think. Um, so then when I, but then the difference is when I came on to do this final season. So this is now the final season of Top Boy. It's, I'm not sure when it's coming out, but it'll be soon. Um, that I was brought on as lead director. And so I was able to make decisions this time around that I couldn't really in the previous season, um, which meant, firstly, I really wanted to sort of go hark back to the first season of Top Boy, the summer house one. Um, and we were shooting in the summer. So we shot last summer. And I knew I wanted to bring back color. Um, I knew I wanted to bring back that sense of realism, keep it very handheld, keep it loose. Um, and yeah, I think the biggest challenge you normally have as a director is um, getting your notes across on the script. Some It depends when you get brought in, but you might get brought in when like the scripts have all been written and they're not, you know, maybe they don't want to take your notes on. You just have to direct what's on the page. And that can be the case in... I think usually in most American productions. Um, but if you don't agree with stuff in the script, that has to be a process. Whereas obviously if it's your own script, you're just like, not going to do that. It's fine. I'll change my mind here. But here you definitely have to be a bit more, um, you have to be more tactile. So you're not just directing actors and honing a show. You're also managing producers and executives and people around you and you become a lot more aware of audiences 
weirdly you become more aware of audiences through notes you get in the edit and stuff so if I think something is obvious like I think a scene is very obvious and it's but I want to shoot it in a subtle way then a note you might get is like not everyone's going to get it like we have to make it a bit more obvious and you might not agree with that but that comes down to taste so it has to you yeah it, that's when it becomes a bit more delicate I think as a director directing tv basically yeah do you think that's a, a kind of really big difference between um directing for film and uh directing for television um what are the other kind of key key differences between them as someone who's kind of worked across both I think I mean yeah I think the audience thing is definitely the biggest one for film I've so I've not directed a feature film yet but um hopefully when I do go on to I feel like my first feat a first feature feels very much like it's about it's about you being true to who you are as a filmmaker and it's not so much about a box office return like I don't think anyone expects first features to go make loads of money but I think there is expectations on tv series so an episode has, has to end with a hook to make sure you know audiences come back for the next one and um uh it needs to maybe if it's a series that's like needs a return series like you know we want the second season to be commissioned like there's all these pressures on it and I think it is a lot more about yeah there's wider things at play I think yeah um, at the moment, um, which medium do you kind of see a longer future? Do you think that you're like, you've really enjoyed doing some TV, but you'll focus on film? Or do you think like? I think, like- yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think I'll, I'll always prefer writing and directing. But I think what excites me the most about TV is working on scripts that, because I don't think I could ever write TV. I don't think I would be any good at it and I think there's other incredibly talented writers and I think that makes me excited and I think for me the the way I look at it is like I'd love to do tv um scripts or series that are totally different to the films I'm writing like I think there's no point me doing tv series that are very similar to the stuff I'm already writing like I'd love to do like a very gory horror instead or like a <laughs> murder you know what I mean and it's nothing like the shorts or the films I'm writing so yeah. I think and is that would just purely be to like keep things exciting and fresh as a director to like exercise those muscles and to have those challenges like those scenes to get to direct those would be really fun um so I think that's kind of the way I'm looking at planning out which I do when it's almost like brain food, isn't it? Right? Yeah. It's, it's like when you went to Top Boy and then you're like, oh gosh, I've got to shoot handheld all the time. Yeah. It's so frenetic. Um, it's nice. It, I guess it's nice to kind of dip into something that's really unfamiliar and learn some new things that you might bring back. Or you might be like, no, that's not for me. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's exactly. great to do, but not, not for my films. <laughs> um, so the title of this lab is about um, developing your own authentic story and telling your own authentic stories. Um, is that something that you've always felt is possible for you and that you think will always be possible? Um, or have there been barriers that you've needed to overcome? I think the biggest barrier I feel I've had is probably like the fear of being pigeonholed or like pigeonholing myself. Um, I think I've seen this. Obviously, there's been a big shift in the industry. We've got a much harder focus on diversity now and I think um I think sometimes you feel it can be reductive I think sometimes it feels like uh that's the first thing people put on you when they look at you as a as a you know filmmaker it's like oh you're the you know you're the diverse (laughs) brown female filmmaker like surely this is the kind of material you like right um and this this the kind of material you want to do so I think sometimes you have to well, I, 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 anyway, I found myself having to work harder, like not just to prove others wrong, but also to prove it to myself that I deserved to be in certain spaces because I had, you know, artistic integrity that was, you know, beyond my um, difference or like how different I was or whatever. Um, or, you know, like, I think it's interesting when sometimes if people ask, oh, how'd you go about coming up with, interesting diverse characters and you just think well actually the answer is just they look like me and my mom it's not (laughs) just (laughs) right um but I think um yes I think it's the fear of being pigeonholed pigeonholing myself 
being aware of that and navigating that. And um, I think also not putting yourself down. And I think this is probably more like advice I would, I wish I'd given to myself when I was younger, but like, don't, don't put yourself down and don't like have these fears in your head when you step on set. I feel like, um, I've been asked like have you faced sexism and racism on set or whatever and I think actually luckily I've never have but I've also never stepped on the set fearing it like I've never stepped on the set being like oh shit like I'm a woman what kind of you know what kind of treatment am I going to get today like I feel if you've been asked to come on set and you're you've got this opportunity or you're making a film you've got a certain job whatever like you already deserve to be there so there's you got to believe that and you got to come with that I think yeah um, it's surprising how far confidence will get you <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's true yeah um so now you have two features in development um what was it like what has it been like I guess what is it still like um working with major funders on kind of the, the stories that you want to tell yeah so one of the one of the feature films I am developing at the moment is the feature version of Azar, which is the trailer we played earlier. And um, so I made the short film, I made the short film standalone, but I think deep down I always knew there was a wider story and it does, the short film ends in a way that makes you want to, hopefully, I, I think, makes you want to see more of what happens in this world after. So having the short film made it easier I guess in a way to get commissioned for the feature because I think you when you have the short you already have the tone and you have the setting and you have the mood and you kind of have the pace and so because I'm I don't think I'm a great script writer so I think having the film visually as an example of what you know the story was going to be was um um uh, was quite important and I think made it easier to get commissioned um so Azar is the first feature I hope to make, hopefully. Um, and then the second second feature is with uh, BBC and Witchwood. And that sort of came about from meeting, had a period of meeting various producers and uh, met with one and we got on really well. And I had this idea. So we, you know, we developed it together and then took it to BBC. Um, so, so yeah, I think, yeah, having the short was useful to getting that first one commissioned. Um, I am, we've got like millions of questions coming in. So I'm going to um, ask some questions that are not just the thoughts coming out of my brain. Um, but also, I just want to say I'm very excited about the feature of Azar. I really love the short. It's very striking and beautiful. Um, I watched it as a voter in that year. And I was like, this is, the, this is, this is one of my favorites. So oh, very exciting to see that there's a, there's an Azar pipeline. <laughs> yes. um, so, oh gosh, I've got, um, I'm just looking at all of the questions. Uh, oh, wow, Gemma, yeah. has, Gemma has kindly like put them in a special, she's put them into sections for me. <laughs> um, so as we're kind of talking about um, authentic stories, there's a, there's a range of questions that kind of deal with that theme. Um, what have we got? Having different cultural backgrounds, um, how do you feel the balance for stories you want to tell uh, to maintain fidelity to your cultural identities. As an aspiring director from South America, I'm struggling to find the balance between telling stories that represent my culture and the European context where I'm present now. Oh, wait, wait, what was the first part of the question? Sorry. Uh, having different cultural backgrounds, how do you find the balance for the stories yep. that you want to tell that kind of maintain your, your cultural identities? Yeah, um, so I, uh, I guess in terms of my different backgrounds, I um I have Pakistani parents but I was born and brought up in Paris in France and then came to the UK and I think um you can do that visually if you're not doing that in your if you want your stories to I guess be deeply rooted so you're saying South American um it might be a story from there your characters are from there that, that's the language you choose but maybe there's European films you're very much influenced by that you want to use as a visual example like for example I know I was influenced by both like say quite arty French cinema but then also watching lots of Bollywood films that are very like colorful and passionate and I know at some point I decided to mesh the two so I feel like I enjoy having um um you know the colors and vibrancy of 
Bollywood films, but then I'll 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 have quite a reticent approach to the way I shoot it um, and the pacing. So I think as a director, you can do that. Yeah, I guess either visually through your craft, or you can have stories that feel like they're both. But I think it's it can be dangerous to try and all, to try and create boxes in your head that you're trying to fit it into. Like there shouldn't really be a criteria. Um, at its heart, the story should feel true and your characters should feel real, whether they're European or South American. I don't know if that answered it, um, but hopefully that can alleviate some of the pressure. You might be just putting on the story itself. Um, um, we also have a question about um, Azar. It says, the Azar trailer gave me chills. Uh, how did you go about thinking about how you wanted the audience to feel um, while they were watching the film and the trailer? Um, I think you a lot of that comes in the edit. Um, so I'm a firm believe I've been fortunate of having an incredible editor that I've worked with uh, on like three of my shorts. And um, there's one particular shot in Azar where we hold for a long, long time. And you that was deliberate because you hold on it, you hold on it, something awful is about to happen. And you keep thinking there's going to be a cut or like you can feel this anxiety building. And I know that's exactly what I wanted the audience to feel. Um, and so I knew that I wanted to have this feeling of like anxiety, suffocation, and then no real catharsis. And um, one of my favorite directors, Michael Haneke, he does a lot of that in his films. And there's definitely quite a few articles and theses and stuff written about the way he uses these tools of like not releasing catharsis. And I think that's something it is, definitely worth thinking about but in the edit is usually when I start playing with that a lot more um and shooting enough of like shooting a lot of silences sometimes between lines I think that's really useful to have as a director when you get to the edit especially like moments where the characters are just being really still or they're looking and you can you can put whatever line you want under it um yeah I think it, I like to give myself options in the edit um, we have another question about uh, working as a director that I suppose when we were talking earlier you spoke about the importance of um, pulling those emotive performances out of out of an actor um, this question is when you're on set as a director how do you balance between the logistics of blocking scenes um, and focusing on the emotions and making sure that those come through um, I think that's a really good question. Uh, it totally depends, I think, on what you want out of the scene. Like if it's if the scene, so sometimes you'll have a scene where like having the geography of what's happening with your actors is really important and like crucial to what's happening. Um, like for example, it's a heist scene or the thriller scene, and like you know one character has to make it from one room to the other, and then a gunfight happens. Like that's very much you're going to just focus on the blocking, really, because the logic of that is really important. Um, normally when I so like say, for example, with Top Boy, we try to have 360. We try to be able to like have the option of shooting 360 on set. So like not really having lights on the floor, the camera being able to go from here to here. And that meant the actors can move from here to here. Now, Top Boy re relies a lot on having realism, um, like it needs to feel like the characters are living in these spaces and that's how they move about the spaces. So I let the actors usually walk in and unless I concretely need it to be a certain way, I will let them choose where they want to be. Um, and then if it doesn't feel right, I sort of like start shifting it a bit. But you don't really want blocking to get in the way of the emotions. Like if an actor has to like specifically stand up for a certain line and then you can tell they're struggling to also get the emotion across then maybe one has to kind of give way for the other um likewise sometimes some actors feel strongly and they want to move in a certain direction because emotionally that's where it's taking them if that doesn't feel right then you have to find a way of bringing them back but usually I'd say always try and follow um but yeah I say it's let the actors lead you if you want it to feel like they want to inhabit the space um because that's a better way of doing it usually to get the emotions you want 
these are great answers. Um, there's a question here that's about um, kind of staying balanced. And I suppose you you spoke about all the different things that you had done and you were at NFTS and in the edit for Azar and shadowing on Top Boy and then doing an episode. And in between your courses, you were teaching and like doing a random act. Um, so do you have any tips on staying balanced or developing a routine that helps uh, when it comes to being more balanced with creativity and work and your kind of real life? Oh, yeah, I struggle. <laughs> Routines, I wish, like, I've been one of those people who's like, I'd love to get up at 5 a.m. and drink a smoothie and then do Pilates <laughs> on a Wednesday. I just can't. Not I've really. struggled with it yeah, my whole life. Um, it's just not something I think I've accepted I can't. Um, but if anyone is able to, I think it's great. I think... Um, it depends where you're at because obviously you go through such different modes of being and such different emotions when you're in different phases of making a film there's that phase of just writing which is very lonely and you're sort of by yourself and you sit you might be at home a lot or you go to a cafe that's when you might get into a nice home workout routine and you cook food and shit but like <laughs> afterwards when you're on set and you're on set for 10 weeks you don't have a social life anymore um so I think my I think it's listening to your body and listening to your mind like now I know that routine doesn't work but I also know when I feel like I've depleted my creative resources and reserves so I'll try and like get into a good book non-fiction book where I can read a story and sort of get lost in it or I start to feel like oh I haven't seen like a film that's moved me in a while I've just been watching these uh, TV series or like reality TV like I need to get back into watching films so I think it's doing things that nourish you um, creatively like making sure you do that but it shouldn't feel like a chore because that's or it shouldn't feel like homework because um, I think yes being able to creatively pull from something it's really important to have that and you will feel depleted and you will feel like you need to take a break um, but having normalcy and having a social life is really important as well. Um, I have one about, I have quite a few about getting started in the industry, um, but it's an interesting one about script writing. So um, how did you navigate the scale of your early scripts? I often find during script writing, the script will become overly ambitious and therefore perhaps less likely to get funded because it would cost too much, it's too long. Um, so how did you kind of manage that? Uh, is I, just, I don't know if this is in relation to short films or features. I think, yeah, when short films, I think I was very aware of what I would be able to shoot on the budget that I had. Like, I knew if I'm going to write this scene, like, there's no point because I'm not going to be able to shoot it. So I would um, save myself the heartache and sort of write um, uh, locations that I knew I had access to or were attainable and um, so it, I guess it's being strategic, but I never felt stifled by it, the logistics or like the, the constraints of it or the limitations, I think. It allowed me to kind of like, okay, how do I make this film where I'm, it's entirely in a house? How do I feel like it can still be a space that's lively or whatever? Like, you know, you start to think of compensating in other ways. Um, however, with the feature, I have just written what I want it to be the scale that I want it to be and I am at that stage of waiting to see if we get funded so maybe I'll be able to answer your question in like a few months <laughs> when I'll be told to cut all the horses or whatever um <laughs> so yeah I think um you have to write the story that it needs to be but if you're obviously telling a story that does need you know four scenes in a car on a highway um there's no point trying to make that film without those scenes do you know what I mean I think it, it needs to be appropriate to the story you're telling um sorry I don't think that was very helpful but yeah no, that, that, that's good and that's right and it's sort of like there's also value in being able to think about writing uh within the constraints of like a budget and think about like writing in a way that's realistic and still being able to pull out everything that you're trying to get Everything I think that you're so. trying to say it is problem solving a lot like it's surprising how much we can get away with if you just think about the way you problem solve on set as well like um yeah I mean yeah we we in, a, in one of the films where in fact the one 
in Yoruba, we needed a village, Nigerian village with a hut, and it needed to be in that landscape, but we were in a tiny studio. So we just built the hut and then had a piece of glass in front of the camera where the rest of it was painted around, like the landscape was painted mm -hmm. and it looks different and like great, but it, you know, it's, it was a, something born out of a limitation. So I think it's worth also, you know, having fun with problem solving. Um, how, are there, are there different thing, ways that you would recommend or how do you find funding um, for short films? And do you have any tips on how to work on making a short film with very limited budget? Uh, tips for funding short films. Um, I mean, the, the limited budget thing. I mean, ugh, I think... Uh, Yes, sorry. So I'm just, so <laughs> I, I think having a producer, honestly, I think is the one of the best things. I have a, if you know any friends or whatever that are producers or production managers, because they will help you budget and they'll help also like source things. Like some people are just really good at getting things for free or like cutting deals and negotiating and haggling. Um, working with other student actors that you don't necessarily have to pay. You know, and sometimes people will work for free if they absolutely love the script and it's going to bring you all up and, you know, it's going to be helpful for their showreel and your showreel. It depends what level you're at. Um, but I think, yeah, it's, um, I don't know what fundings are out there actually at the moment, but I think it's definitely being resourceful. Like just having someone who is good at negotiating and haggling is really useful. It goes a long way. Um what about directing films did you find uh, unexpected? Oh gosh, my question's just disappeared, sorry. <laughs> um, in other words, what about directing isn't visible until you're knee deep in the process itself? Um, I think it's the fact that we think directors should know everything. It's totally untrue. I think um, I accepted that I don't always have the answers. Like sometimes I'd be... Uh, you know, we've blocked a scene, the lighting's there, the camera's there, costumes are on, everything's looking great. And the lines are being said exactly as they've been written and everything should work and it feels wrong. And in the moment, I can't think quickly enough of like why it feels wrong or what should it be instead. And you feel like you're going to have to like piss everyone off and change it completely. Um, so I think a big misconception is definitely like we that you you need to know at all times exactly what's right and wrong. So it's also, um, um, you know, not giving off this false air of confidence, being vulnerable enough to say, I need five minutes, actually. Can we just stop for like five minutes? I just need to go away and think about it. I'm really not sure what the answer to this is, but can we try this? Can we try that? Um, having that humility, I think, of accepting when you're not sure of being able to lean into others uh, for having the answers and seeing that sometimes when you get to the edit as well, you're like, you've got the film in front of you and it's not the film that was written. So don't cut against it. Or sometimes you're making the film and you realize, oh, this is what it's meant to be. Um, so I think it's also having an immense amount of patience, not just with others, but yourself. I think there's never any point in like, like having a you know an outburst on set or like being angry or being mean to anyone um I think it's having that control over yourself is really important um yeah I would say those are the things that you never quite know until you're starting to do it and function in it this is interesting I remember watching a video um that stated that to be a director it's better to read more books about leadership do you agree <laughs> And I would add, do you think that there are other things that people should be reading or watching um, to kind of develop the right skills to be a director? Um, I never read a single book about leadership <laughs> and I hate the idea of like a director considering the, like, you know, I don't know, something about like, I'm a leader. Um, so I think the biggest um, thing, the it's just talking to people, it's relating to people, it's... Um, I don't know, maybe I guess the skills you learn in therapy or like in problem solving and conflict solving, like it, things get really emotional <laughs> on set and things get really emotional uh, behind the scenes. And 
I think you need to have that ability to uh, really get someone's trust, especially when you're doing scenes where actors need to go mentally to places that are quite dark or like they need to trust that the the decision you're making for them is going to put them in the best light for this. Like if um, I need to make sure my actors trust me completely, if I say that was great, we're going to move on. Like they need to believe that. I think also learning to deal with being uncomfortable with people, like being in uncomfortable um, personal settings with people and like uh, dealing with that. I think it's more about emotional management. Um, when writing, what have you found to be key for creating emotional scenes, moments and storylines? When writing? Um, I think sometimes oh I'm not sure I think it's it, you know what's interesting is also like what is emotional to me on screen might be like totally different for someone else and sometimes you read lines and you think oh that's too emotional or that's like too obvious and you know I sometimes find for me emotional is like um like I'm really into that feeling character like you know you have just before you're about to cry but you're actually stifling your tears and you have a knot in your throat and you're holding it all back and you don't cry and you don't scream but everything you've seen this character go through makes you want to tell him scream so I think for me it becomes about building up to that or it becomes about like it's more on set I think it's more the way I see how the actors are going to do it so I might write it though I might write like she takes a sharp inhale and then I might not write you know what happens next or the exhale so I try and get that across so the actors kind of know where we're going to go with it um but you don't want to write she breaks down crying I feel like sometimes that scares actors a bit um but it depends if you know exactly who you've cast and who you're going to work with it totally depends yeah right I think uh this is going to be the last question um and then I'll I'll Sadly, finish the call uh, and go back over to Gemma. But um, last question, last question. Um, I'm an aspiring autistic filmmaker wanting to create a film about my personal experiences and perspective on the world. Do you have any advice for conveying personal stories and experiences authentically in a film? Mm, I think my advice is just to... Um, if it feels authentic to you, it'll feel authentic to others. Like it's about universe. Like I think most emotions are universal. And I think um, as long as it comes from a place of truth, like as long as what the character goes through feels truthful to you, then that's totally okay. Like you don't need someone else's permission for what, you know, like I said, it's about different interpretations. Like uh, the experience you're trying to put on screen might feel really true and authentic to you but if it doesn't to me that's not your problem in a way like as a direct as a short filmmaker like it's especially with short films it's your time to kind of express it your way and the whole point of making films as well is maybe to be making different to tell different stories and different perspectives so you might be telling you might be showing something that maybe hasn't necessarily been shown before and th then you have no one to really to turn to for like advice on is this, you know, correct? Because it's this, it that's it. There's no right or wrong with it. Um, so I'd say it has to just feel true to you, and also it doesn't hurt to take liberties. Sometimes it doesn't all have to be rooted in absolute truth in terms of like how you show what a character goes through. What I mean with that is like more like the story elements. Um, it's okay for things to feel heightened here and there as long as it's what you like and it's the way you want to tell your film um, is the way I'd start at the beginning, yeah. Thank you so much for watching this BFI Film Academy Lab session on developing your project and telling your own authentic stories. We run monthly live digital labs and would love to see you at our next event on the 21st of August. It will be all about working with a producer and producing your own films. To find out more about this session, visit our lab's webpage, which you can find in the video's YouTube description, and follow Film Academy on our social channels. Thank you and see you next time.